So um, we're going to talk about the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People initiative and how that all got started. But first, let me just give you a little bit of background about myself. This was my introduction to coral reefs really back in 1990. I was a Peace Corps volunteer straight out of um, undergrad at study marine science in the University of South Carolina, that's where I'm from. I kind of knew I wanted to be a marine biologist from the time I was in middle school watching the jump. So you know, kids are just take it for granted. You can watch like whatever you want on the kids. But I had to wait till Sunday evening, 5 30. Once a week, I got to see the ocean on Jockey's Ghost TV show. <laughs> Otherwise, that probably made it more special than having it all available all the time. But anyway, I followed my dream, did that bad, decided I wanted a real world experience and joined Peace Corps, which was actually a great opportunity because I got sent to Belize, where they were kind of on the leading edge of implementing these marine protected areas. And that, that was my office. So that's Old Chan Marine Reserve, 1990. They had fully protected it. And it was crazy amounts of fish were just starting to go back. The fishermen and everyone in tourism, so that's it's a natural whole channel means little channel in Mayan. And it's it was always a natural fishing spot. So there was a little backdoor negotiation with the fishing cooperative whose freezer had broken. Conservation groups agreed to give them a new freezer, which they really needed for all of their fishing activities, and they gave away whole chan. So and then it became a huge success, and those same fishermen began leading tours, you know, doing a mixture of fishing and tourism, and they fished less, and then they saw what that park did for the community. Because this is the main attraction for the whole Embers Key of Belize, which is the major tourist destination. So it kind of happened really organically that I learned about how valuable reefs are. And yes, tourism is typically the largest value when you start doing these economic evaluations of coral reefs. Um, it believes the total value of the reef was determined to be between 325 and 559 million US dollars per year. So that's, um, that's about like uh, half the GDP of the country that the reef is giving it every year. That's based on those three values, tourism, fisheries, and coastal protection. Coastal protection is something that's been a little bit newer to figure out, like how do you evaluate that? But you can look at the physical dynamics of your, um, of the layout, the geography of, of your beaches and your island, and you can see how much of that beach is actually protected by coral reef, and calculate like what would happen to the beach if the reef was to die or go away. So it's major, especially when you have more infrastructure built along the shore, which is also a bad thing, but it does contribute to the value we also know that coral reefs are threatened, and some of the main threats um, all over the world, also in the whole Caribbean, is coastal development and pollution. It's often coming from that development or coming from farther inland. So where we are situated in Central America, you know, you've got major watersheds, mountains, industry up in the hinterlands that might be 50 miles away, but that pollution is still coming off. Overfishing is one of these things that can be, it's really pervasive. It's pretty much everywhere because coral reefs are so easy to overfish. They're not these um, quick turnover productive systems like in temperate environments where you have a lot of upwelling and anchovies or small fish and you can just keep taking from that. And it's, it's very easy to manage, it's easier to manage that type of fishery. A coral reef has, tends to have large body and older fish and you have to be really careful in how you manage it. And there's you know, hundreds of fish species that are fished, and the biology of each one is different, and we don't know it all, and of course we can regulate it. So overfishing is one of those things that you can't necessarily see it with your eye, but it's there, and it has been you know, historical. They figured for the last you know, over 100 years, the whole period of pretty much been overfished. Things are not the way they would be without any fishing. Um, bleaching and climate change are the newer threats that we'll talk about a little bit, and not too much we can do as like local coral reef managers other than build resilience and try to alleviate all the other threats. So those corals will be healthier and, and they'll be able to survive the stress that they will feel from rising temperatures and ocean acidification and maybe stronger storms. Oh crap, sorry, because I'm on the wrong slide. I was, because I'm looking at the um, 
the next one. So that was the threatened ones when I was talking about those things. Sorry about that. I'm not used to this view of seeing both of them. So the goal of management then is to protect those values while still allowing them to use. So we, you know, we are valuable to people because they contribute to all this you know, economic development and beauty and recreation and all of the other values. And so a successful program of, of reef management can support both you know, the ecosystem and the economy of the country. So in our region, we kind of tell our story of how we got started. It all began in 1997. That was the very first International Year of the Reef. Probably didn't have much to do with it, but it did create you know, this international discussion about coral reefs. People were beginning to realize that, hey, they were actually in trouble. Because before that, that wasn't widely um, agreed upon that coral reefs were a threatened ecosystem. But the Year of the Reef kind of started talking about that, and it got the four leaders of these Mesoamerican countries, the President of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and the Prime Minister of Belize, came together and signed an accord. It was called the Tulum Declaration, and it basically just said, we're going to work together to support the health of the reef, to conserve this shared resource. And that was a big deal because these countries don't always get along. Um, Guatemala has a claim on Belize, about half of its territory, so that's a sticky situation. That took a lot of effort to do that, but people saw the, the value in Belize. We also recognize that the Guatemalan watersheds are affecting their threat to the reef because there's a lot of pollution going on, and the fishermen are fishing in Belize. So you need to pull them in to um, the conversation and be part of it. I don't know how much transboundary fishing you have maybe from Haiti or other places. We don't have the watershed it, 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 um, impacts from other countries as much as we do. But in this region, that international collaboration was really important. So everybody was feeling great, like you know, start something really new. And then came the year um, after the year of the reef, which was 1998, the first mass bleach, bleaching event globally. And our reefs just went tank, went white. They were totally white for the first time we'd seen that level of hurricane, I mean, that level of coral bleaching, and right on top of it came this hurricane bitch that was a Category 5, and it sat right off the Roatan, Honduras, one of our best reef areas for like three days, and just got stuck and wobbled around. The waves came to Belize, pounded it, beat up the whole reef of Belize, and it was just, it was just really discouraging. We were looking at a lot of beaten up reef. It really didn't look like that, because it didn't have all that macroalgae. That's one thing about hurricanes. That they pull off the macro algae. But, you know, it, it left us looking at a beaten up reef and saying, well, is it, we know that's not healthy. We can look at that. There's one fish, there's a lot of macro algae. And we started talking about the fact that the, our reef was beaten up from hurricane and bleaching, but it didn't really die from the bleaching. It bleached, but most of it came back. It was a minor amount of death. And then we started discussing, and some of our donors that were supporting the marine conservation in the regions, these like private family foundations, and then there was a large um, global environment facility, like it's a multinational grant that they give to the countries, and then the countries kind of decide how to spend it. These, these GEF projects, talk about those later, but that's how you can tap into some of the, the largest money for conservation. But they were just starting this project, and we're all looking at this beaten up reef going, or we do. And, you know, it's like, Scientists, a few of us scientists in the region are saying, no, we're not doomed. It's like the, the reef isn't necessarily unhealthy, it's just injured. Like you've been in some kind of awful accident. You know, you're in a car accident, you might be in the hospital with one of those stretcher beds with your legs lifted up, broken bones, but you're not necessarily unhealthy. And if your body's healthy, you're going to recover more quickly. And, but that's what we were trying to figure out, and we came up with this whole system for about two years of being very scientific <coughs> and uh, going in great detail, probably too much detail, this is like 60, 64 indicators, but basically you're looking at the fact that the reef, you have elements that are structural, what builds the reef, and what are the components that need to be there, and then you have these functional elements, you have to, ecological processes have to be maintained, like reproduction, recruitment, herbivory, and then you need to categorize and understand your threats. What are the things that are going on? For us, it was um, looking at land use and agriculture, fishing, like I said, tourism, coastal development. And then we wanted to bring in the social side. 
and so we talked to a lot of social scientists and like what are the indicators of you know, you've got things like poverty, you've got economy, looking at um, employment based on the reach and how you can sustain that, and policies, what kind of policies are your government putting in place? So we, we did this whole, um, we built this initiative really around designing a concept for how you can understand the health of the reef in a really comprehensive way. And then we kind of build it down to these three main um, objectives. So we began by getting everyone together in a room. Um, all of the having the four countries come together is kind of a, a major challenge because it's not easy. There's not a lot of like uh, transport between the countries. Sometimes you even have to fly to Miami to get back to another country. It's just crazy. Or you have really expensive flights or really insanely long bus rides, but people were dedicated and they came together and by getting everyone in the room, we did a visioning exercise where we came up with what we saw as what we want to achieve with a healthy reef. Like what does a healthy reef mean to you? And I think this is like, it's a step that most people would kind of just jump over, but it gives everyone a chance to articulate what it is that they want to see in a healthy reef. Because some people are more focused on fish, some on corals, some on biodiversity, some on sustaining economies and sustaining livelihoods of, of local communities. All of that is important. So giving everyone a platform to talk about it makes it a more um, cohesive, it makes everyone that's involved feel like they're part of it. And then we developed the idea of taking a few of those massive number of indicators that we can't even remember and looking at what are we actually doing in our monitoring programs, which of those can we incorporate into a report card that would be easy to understand and would capture the most important indicators of reef health. Just focus on the reef health and say, how would we, you know, what could we pull together that we could promote to the public, to the policymakers, and help make them understand how, how is the reef doing? We want to be able to answer that simple question and not be a bunch of scientists who stream on. 12 paragraphs and caveats and footnotes and all that. And then we wanted to enhance collaboration. Because we have four countries, lots of NGOs, local NGOs, international NGOs, universities, and government departments all trying to work together. A common goal, but not always working together. That was, that was another main component of what we were trying to do, to build that networking and collaboration so people could work together. So that what you see there is like a 250-page book that represented the concept. And so people read it and they said, oh, yeah, this makes sense. I now understand like what it means to talk about the health of the reef or why you monitor all this stuff or what, what it's important for. And then we, we incorporated ideas of the threshold values, targets, like what should you realistically be aiming for for coral recruitment? How many recruits per meter square is good? So if you don't know that, then you're just out monitoring, you come out with numbers, throw in a report, and go on. You don't really know whether you're, you're in your good zone or in the, the critical or the bad zone. So that was the first thing we did. So then in 2008, that blue cover is um, the first report card we did. And that was done with, um, with one big study that was carried out by probably like six NGOs. Um, the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund paid for it in the two in different like subsets for the different countries. And then we assisted <laughs> and a few of the other larger NGOs that had staff. We went out and collected data from like 326 reef sites. So it was one kind of synoptic survey done by a smaller group. Prepared this first report card, kind of as an example so people can see what what are we talking about a report card from the reef like a lot of people did get it. So that was great. Then the next one, that yellow one, um, it's like three, two years later, it, we were asking for data from these partners. And by then, the initiative started with about five partners. And by 2010, we probably had about 25 partner groups, the, mostly the ones that are managing marine protected areas. And we were asking them to contribute data. A lot of them did. Some of them didn't. They didn't have it ready or whatever. But So that report card, we didn't have nearly data, we only had like 200 sites. We just said, okay, well that's what we've got, let's go on. Next year we had probably like 250, and this last year, this report card, which I have a few copies of, so okay, um, we had back to like 300, over 300 sites. So 
I think one of the lessons is, you know, it just takes time, and you have to kind of lead by example, and you just do what you can with the information you have and the partners you have. Do the job, try to be inclusive of everyone, and it will grow naturally. It's kind of like a snowball rolling down the hill. It kind of naturally accumulates more stuff. It's bigger. In all of these report cards, we include recommendations, you know, kind of towards the end. Typically, you get through all the news of how the is doing, and then you get to recommendations of what can you do about it. What are the management actions that can help improve things? And we realized after about the second or third one, we're just making the same recommendations, and we're not really tracking ourselves. We're not giving a report card back on ourselves as the community that's trying to improve the health of the community. We're all working on this, but we're not evaluating our, ourselves or our governments or our countries to say how we're doing. So we decided to do this eco-audit thing. So this is kind of what it looks like. We have these 28 indicators. And each one is like a pie that gets filled more or less completely. So it's a grading criteria, like it would say what you aim to achieve. You want to have a policy fully protecting parrotfish, but you have a few steps along the way to get there. If you've done the, the regulation completely, then you get a five. If you've taken the very first steps, maybe surveying populations and doing a report, you get a one. So it was very transparent. We had the Price Waterhouse Coopers people help us do it. They said it, as far as I knew, had never been done before on like a multi-country scale with this kind of level of, um, of input in so many different groups. We are now at the, our last survey. We're at 62% completion, so you know, a little over halfway there. Um, but yeah, students would know that's not a really good score. Take that home to mama, and you're not going to get anything good. This is kind of the way we see those um, report cards, and the eco audit is what in Spanish we call it informes. I don't know why this slide is in Spanish, but I guess I'm about to change it. Um, but so the report cards, the eco audits, and the um, outreach to media, I think that's the other key component that we've learned over the years that, you know, you can do all the reports you want, but if nobody sees it or it's just your same little group, it only gets you know a certain amount of traction. It can't build momentum unless you get it really out in the popular view. So you, using the media and like local television stations and local newspapers is the best way to reach a wide audience. So we really tap into that, and we all of our events we have you know the, the local news, and they know our coordinators, and they really push it. And so the people in the on the street know what the report card is and they like it and they think that's cool. And then you do another one and like they're interested enough to like track it and follow it. And that all contributes to the health of the week. And the core of it, the base of it, is that you have to have this monitoring. You have to have the monitoring and good database that allows you to do this for a long term. So our report cards end up uh, the region is kind of long, so there it is. You can't look at it in one screen or you can't really see it. So this is the northern section of it. Um, we like to look at, this is last year's version, so it's the 319 of these sites. The color code, let me sit down there so you can see the color code, the blue is very good, green is good, yellow is fair, orange is poor, and red is critical. So you can rank the reefs based off these four um, indicators. That's coral cover, herbivorous fish biomass, commercial fish biomass, and fleshy macro algal cover. And what depth is someone taking it? That is the maximum depth. The maximum depth? Yeah. Well, it kind of ranges. So most of the sites were, were picked um, off of satellite imagery. You know, so we have this map of the reefs. And so they were randomized based on where the reef extent is. So it goes down to, some sites are down around 25 meters, 20 Sorry, 20 meters, um, but that's not many. So there's very few sites that are down there. Most of them are up around um, 10 meters, 7 meters. There's a fair amount of shallow reef, too, that's like inside the area of the reef or around these patches. So there's a, there is a wide depth distribution, but it's pretty much based off where the reefs are. Um, so 
Based on those four indicators, you rank them. See, there's the ranges of like the coral cover, what's considered very good, good, fair. So you just give them a score for each of those. Every site gets a score one through one through five for each of those four things, and then you just average it out. They're all equally rated. So that enables you to go back and say, you know, each site gets a one index score. It's not perfect. But it's kind of like the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You know, if you're a stockholder, it may not tell you exactly what your stock is doing, but it's a good general tracking of, of the stock market. When the Dow Jones is up, most people's stocks are up, and when it's down, most things are down. So that's kind of the way you can look at it. It's a, you know, you roll it all together into this index, and you lose. You, you don't see exactly what's the bad or good component of it. But it does make it a nice way that you can track it on a large scale. Or something like a, a politician or your you know, your premier won't want to know exactly what's happening with fleshy macroalgae versus something else. They just want to know how's the reef doing. So when you're on that upper level, you know, this is what people want to see. And the number of sites. So you can look at how sites, you can see that most sites are actually ranked in poor condition. Although the overall ranking, when you average that out, is fair. So it's, it's very close. It's on the high end of poor to the low end of fair. That's the that's American reef overall. You can see that it varies a bit. Honduras has more of the good sites and the fair sites, and Guatemala is kind of doing the worst. No fair for the good site. We also look at subregions because these sites are, you know, each site is just. Um, it's the, how the reef is doing in that particular location, which isn't really the most useful thing. Unless you're looking at zoning in a marine park, then you would want to look at like three or four sites inside a closed zone versus an open zone. But it's better to um, average out the, the data you're getting from individual sites into these subregions. So these subregions are you know, by geographic units. We've got 17 of them. And you can see that three of them came out ranked as good. So that was very encouraging. Um, some of them had improved, like maybe the Lighthouse Reef and the Leeds had improved from previous years, and some of them got worse in terms of the subregion. That central zone in the Leeds that's red was not red in previous years. So, and then we put it into it, we can see what happened, you know, like the fish biomass, both commercial and rivers fish, had just tanked in that two year period. So I'll talk more about that later when we go into the detailed version. But a lot of the work in the region has been on marine protected areas. And that's what brought a lot of these groups together. Um, I think this region, you can look at that, that um, area graph there, and you can see Mexico is in blue, and uh, Belize is in orange, Honduras in gold, Guatemala in gray. So Guatemala has a very small piece of Caribbean coast, and all of their fisheries and marine interests has really mostly been on the Pacific. So they're only now starting to kind of realize that they have coral reef in, in their little bit of territory in the Caribbean and starting to make more efforts to protect it. So they're a little behind. And, and that's one thing that this kind of regional effort can do is to help you know, bring up the countries that are, haven't been doing this as long. So, Okay, what you're seeing here, that's the increase in the number of MPAs over time. So you can just see how it really jumped around like 96 to 2000, and then we're still increasing the area, the number of MPAs, which is good. 57% of the territorial sea that's within our boundary of what we call the mar is within marine protected areas. So that beats the targets of all these, these like challenges, the, um, Caribbean challenge that they've asked for 20% or whatever. But so we've done a good job of that. And you can see uh, for the management, um, 13 of these are considered to be have good management. So this was like a, a management ranking process, mostly done by the managers in a group with their colleagues around. So they, they had to you know, rank. It's a group effort, so it's truthful. 17 moderate and 17 inadequate. So that kind of gives you a sense. So some of these are still paper parks or very widely managed, but most of them have staff, most of them have good management, or at least some moderate. They don't have everything they need, 
but they have um, they have management. The big problem, the the number that we're really pushing to work on is that three percent. RZs means replenishment zone. So that's the areas that actually there's no fishing. It's, you know, I mean, a marine protected area in most places doesn't mean it's protected from fishing. So that's kind of a weird, you know, truth that they do a lot of good. They manage tourism. They give you a boundary where you could say, okay, there's a, a management entity that's in charge of this, and they can make certain additional rules, whether it's for fishing or for tourism, to make sure that tour guides are licensed so they can check all those kinds of things. But they're not really protecting from fishing for the most part. So you can see that number is really small. And so we're expecting that 3% to be able to reseed everything else. So I think that's why we're having, like, we haven't gotten that number up. If you take the reef area, that number is actually like 13%. So it's better. So this is territory of sea. We do all of our stats off that because that's the area that each country is responsible for. And we actually do care about the deep sea habitats too. A lot of this is really deep and we don't know what's down there, but there are also, you know, Important fisheries and species that need to be protected in the deep sea. So for the reef, it's 13%. Um, we can look at some of these numbers here that you see, like so. You can tell by country there's a big difference. Mexico clearly has the, the most protection. That's 97% is in the NPAs. 4% is fully is fully protected. Then those numbers underneath it are about what percent of that family of fish is actually of reproductive size. So when we do these fish counts, we talk a lot about biomass, which is just it's the size and number of fish, how much fish biomass is out there. So you don't just count the fish because a big one counts more than a small one. Right? But we also, because we're taking the lengths of the fish, what we did in this report card, it was the first time that I think it's ever been done, is like we're now measuring the population based on what percent of it can reproduce. So 35% of the groupers um, can reproduce in Mexico, of all the ones that are of reproductive size, which isn't too bad. 77% of the snappers. So you can see the snappers are easier to manage. They don't live as long, they don't tend to get as big, most of them, as the groupers. So they're easier to manage. You can, you know, that's, that's a decent fishery. You've got 77% of your fish or reproductive size, they're going to be able to reproduce. But so look down like in Guatemala, Guatemala's got um, only 3% of the group of were mature and 10% of the snapper. So, and Belize wasn't too much better, 26% of the groupers were mature, 40% of the snapper. So this is where that, the, you know, the data can be really useful to show you, well, yes, we're, you know, we're doing these things, we've got these protected areas, but because those replenishment zones are so small, that's those are really the only places where you're getting the big fish because they can live long enough to get big and be reproductive. And that's your source for more fish to be seeded in the outside areas. So you can see it by just taking a few examples of, of fish, like yellowtail snapper, that's one of the best things to eat because it's like it's more best in terms of sustainability because it they, they are like some of the highest percent of their population being mature. 86% of yellowtails are mature. We didn't have any mature bear snappers in our sample. Of course, there's some out there, but you know, taking a representative sample, this was out of 69,000 fish, so it's quite a, hot, a big sample. This is over the whole time frame. And 148 sites. So you can see the larger fish, like the black grouper, only 8% of those that were counted were of mature size. So this this is a problem for those bigger fish. And again, the only, the best way, I mean, you could have a maximum size limit to say you can't fish any fish over, for each fish it would be a different length, which makes it really difficult for the fishermen to remember all this. Are they going to be able to restrain themselves from taking it? It's hard, it's just easier generally as a tool to create a closed zone and nobody fishes there and then you get all this for all the species. I think there was a hand. Yeah. Conditions, kind of biogeographic, ocean currents, less warming, all of these parameters that they bring into papers to read. It's open access, you can download it. But the result came out kind of looking like this. I just 
zoomed in. They did this globally, but we won't worry about the rest of the world. Um, we will look at the Caribbean, and you can see over here my side. Let me see if I can point. Yes, yeah, so my, my corner of the world over here, not looking too good. Most of a lot of it's red, a little bit of it's in the blue green. But you guys over here, you're surrounded by this kind of nice section of the blue is, is good. Those are the areas that were less prone to be impacted by climate change. So unfortunately, the way they name this stuff in their report, they kind of come out calling it um, the Bahamas, and then they talked about Greater Antilles, which they called Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. And they forgot about the <laughs> I think you can make a really good case and say, hello, Turks and Caicos, right in the middle of all that. You know. I mean, we have to zoom in and look better at those reefs than you guys could find yourselves there. Um, yeah, it's a good, I think that's a good option for like, you've got to position, the whole thing with conservation is like you know, positioning yourself globally and getting your name out there and you've got to make Turks and Caicos like, no. I think, you know, Belize kind of was a leader, I think, in the Mesmeric Reef because they had this research station, the Smithsonian Research Station has been there since 72. They were producing a lot of science, scientific papers speaking English and the rest of the region didn't and a lot of scientists went there and then work, you know, begets more work. So people came in and worked and then it just became a little center for kind of science and then conservation. So you have to get to that, you have to kind of create that hump, get over that hump, get Turks and Caicos on the map of conservation. And then you can, it's easier to raise a lot more money. There is money out there. This is coral reef funding from 2010 to 2016. Total, total value, which is a little dicey. That's 1.9 billion, um, but 343 million of that was the primary funding, which is cash. That's really what we care about. The rest of that is like what they were spending anyway. You know, that's the matching funds. So it's actually not that much compared to other issues, other things that are funded. You know, infrastructure globally. This is a global number. And you know it's not that great, but look at uh, the orange is actually from these multilateral agencies. So that's what I was saying about like the global environment facility, and they tend to like to give to multinational um, initiatives. So like if Turks and Caicos could get together with Bahamas and maybe somebody else, or if you want to do DR or Haiti or something, you get a little group together of your neighboring countries and you present. Big project idea, multi million, multi year. That's how you can tap into like some of this bigger funding. Um, these are the five, the white part on the bottom, the, the main group, the main donors. And you can see like most of it. In terms of, the, let's look at this column, the primary funding, that's the cash that we're going to care about. Most of it was from the GEF. So that global environment facility is the one that's getting out. The most money for coral reefs globally. The Green Climate Fund is next, so if you can tap into some of that, I don't know who from Church and Caicos goes to these UN FCC meetings, but getting somebody that's really good and a networker to go in there and tap into some of this Green Climate Fund, saying you're building resiliency in your reefs by doing X, Y, and Z. And then the Oak Foundation, so this is one of our core donors, or it has been. They are just, they have. Um, pulled out of these because they donated for, I guess it was 12 years, and they said, that's enough for you guys, you're on your own. And now we're looking in other parts of the world, and they're huge. Uh, they do a lot of um, fisheries work, climate change work, and coral reef work. But I definitely have um, inroads in that foundation, and that's one that you can definitely tap into because they're, they're big. And I'm sure you've gotten um, European Um, looking here, I think that's important. We're not doing too bad in the wider Caribbean. So I was kind of surprised that that number was that big, you know, compared to the Pacific, 210 million. So we've actually been, we're a lot smaller. We've <laughs> gotten a lot more money than the Pacific or South Asia. So this is all a report. I can give you a link to it. And we can create like a Dropbox folder. Oh, 
Are you seeing that? Oh, that's my picture. So yeah, lastly, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that. I do work for the Smithsonian, so um, Smithsonian Trust. So we're like a little bit different from the federal arm of the Smithsonian. A lot of scientists are working in these spaces where it's like um, that we've named it working land and seascapes. <coughs> on the land, it's largely agricultural areas, um, places where they're doing infrastructure development, and they want scientists to come in and say, how can we make this less damaging, you know, kind of like mitigation thing. So places around the world um, where Smithsonian has long-term uh, scientific interest and now even conservation programs. And so the institution overall has created this conservation commons where they're dedicating some of their fundraising talent and energy to say, okay, let's support some of these places and look at how we can roll out some of the, um, the things we've learned about how to incorporate science into conservation into new areas. So that's where I have mentioned um, in terms of Caicos, in terms of that, and like there's a, you know, part of the Caribbean we haven't been in before that we would like to um, see if we could incorporate some of the same tools and actions that they've done. Western Caribbean over there and see how it can work if we can roll it out and make it make sense. So they are behind it and there's you know teams that are like starting to look at where we can find funding to do types of projects like that. So um, we should talk about that in the afternoon session, maybe get more details on that kind of thing. But that's mostly the overview, you know, thinking in terms of um, conservation of structure of reefs the function of reefs, and that gives you your whole biodiversity picture. And also restoration. We can talk in the later sections, we can talk a little bit about restoration. I don't know how much you've had going on with coal restoration. It is, it is really a big deal now. It's moving. It's got a lot of momentum behind it. And I think it makes sense in, a, in terms of getting a lot of, um, getting other people involved that might not get hands on the water. And it really gives people a sense that they're doing something. Kind of like picking up the plastic off the beach. You can do it, you can see it, you see this volume that you picked up. You can plant corals and you can see them grow and it does really get you engaged and it does some good for the reef too. And if you do it in a smart way, they're really getting smart and better at how that it's it's getting much faster so they can have more impact. I like to sort of follow up on what you said when you talk about funding because this country is in the process of generating a kind of budget. And by way of introducing us to the younger students here, everybody here is aware that there's something called a departure tax, which is approximately 12%, I think it is currently. What not everybody is aware of is one of those 12%, meaning approximately 10% of that departure tax, has been pre-committed since, I think, 1993 something called the Conservation Fund. It meant that this country at that time really believed beautiful by name. And they had allocated this money. And at the time it stopped being brought to the public's attention, the Treasury reported there was over $6 million in the Treasury already from taking that 1% of the 12%. And I bring it up because it offers not only a wonderful chance to make that funding available if someone else wants to come in and encourage it to be brought back alive. But I think among the local people here, it represents the only way that we're going to be able to support a project like this. And by way of emphasis, and I see two members of the DGCR here reading more of it. Over 20 years ago, there was a massive effort in this country to promote the very things you're talking about. And the budget for the DGCR at that time, which is 20 years ago, was over a million dollars a year just going to the DGCR to take care of the marine environment. Now, where did, how come this hasn't been something that this 1% isn't available, which is well over a million dollars a year today, easily? And the answer is the public's been apathetic. 
And I believe British West Indies had a young lady who was here approximately two years ago, who went off to graduate school, who had committed her personal energy to try to help bring this conservation fund back alive. It is, it is legally legislated, it's, it's a matter of reality, and it just needs some people to start saying, we want to keep our country as it is and enhance it. And I think the younger people have a responsibility to do that because they know better how to use the media than us people with the gray hair. <laughs> and I remember those times. Yeah. When there was a lot of money in BCI. Yeah. And now we have our time buying gas. And, and well, has anybody graphed, I'm just visualizing like a graph of tourist um, Arrival or departure. That's why we're so, talking to the so, young people. Yeah, they've got, you know, they've got departure tax. It must be going up because you've got more people coming, right? So the yes. Yeah, no, 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 there's no, there's no argument that yeah, the money the is there. The amount of going up and but the budget it, it, for your environment department is going down. And, is and going we down? see the policy. I right? emphasize the budget is being done right now. So if the young children, the young adults, really, can start to say, wait a minute, we have something called a conservation fund that has committed 1%, not 1% of the of the 12%, of one of those 12%. That's a huge amount of money of the well, departure tax. What is the 12% of what? When you come here and, and, and you leave this country, uh, you're going to off, pay a 12% right? departure tax on, I think, probably the price of your airplane ticket. I'm not sure. John may know more about what it actually was based on the accommodation tax, not the department tax. It was? Yeah. I apologize. Then it's, then it's what you spent okay. in your accommodation and what have you, has it, and it still does have a 12%. In fact, it's very much a work. The public is very aware of that as we discuss this another matter. Uh, it's one of the questions that I thought of early on, and I think it bears on this whole question of the political will and the will of the government. And you showed early on that there was an estimate of what the uh, reefs mean to the economy of the place. Um, people say we lost the reefs, uh, our tourism will go down here, and so on. But has there actually been any kind of quantification of that? Uh, has someone worked out what would the country lose if, those, if the reefs aren't kept up in real numbers? That kind of thing is what politicians and, and, and the public will react to. And I think that's worth doing, but it hasn't been done. I think the, the politicians should be concerned about losing land if the reef isn't protected. Um, I remember being involved with Chuck when those uh, PhD students came from the UK and did a study here. There were three young ladies that did a study here, yeah. and they um, mostly in Provo, but they went around and met with various groups and fishermen and so forth and um, came up with some conclusions and pretty serious conclusions about um, what would happen to Turks and Caicos if the, especially the barrier reef deteriorates. And uh, it, was, it was, I think they were estimating maybe 2050, I think is what we were looking at. A good deal of land would be gone by that. The beach being eroded. Not just the beach, everything would go inland. I think we were looking at maybe the Leeward Highway as, as being one area that might still exist. The rest of it might be gone. A lot of Grace Bay, a lot of Grace Bay commercial area would be in the water. It sounds like a good, have you had a good um, like video documentary? That we'd like to never heard story. from them again. They were here. We, we met with them, and I don't know. I, I lost touch with them. I don't know if Chuck ever heard from them. That, that I think, was an initiative <coughs> that actually, I think it took place in this room. Now. It was the green, the green group that came down. No, the green, the green environment. The green environment, yeah. Um, they were really trying to focus you on the entire country. Not just the marine environment, but all the rest of it. And, and I think what they tried to do um, ended up going over the heads of most people. And, 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 and one of the problems I think you find in small countries like this, and, and, and it is small relative to the countries you've worked in, is 
that so many NGOs from the outside come in as advocates, but none of them are implementation people. You ought to tie your shoes before you go out and walk. But they don't tell you what to do if your shoes aren't tied, you fall. And, and, and in our case, I, I think that's very significant. I think the other thing in terms of timing right now, you mentioned an, an, an amalgamation between using the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos. This country and the Bahamas are already uh, socioeconomically and, and, and population-wise closely integrated. Everybody's got a relative that either lives up here or lives down here. And I bring that up because the world population just got a recent um, piece of publicity from the advocacy group on behalf of Kong, which again fits dramatically into the various food chains you're referring to in addition to the herbivorous fish. And the Bahamas said, we're going to run out of and that message has already gone out of this country in repetitive time. We're going to run out. Yet the Bahamas are talking to the Chinese. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, as someone who knows more about that animal than anybody walking probably right now, mm -hmm. nobody likes to eat conch better than the Chinese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody. And the fact that they're moving this way, and, and, and I emphasize that because I spent a period of my lifetime figuring out how to get farm live come to China because it was worth as much as abalone to Chinese. So, and they're coming, and they're coming here. They're not always just in the Bahamas, but they're coming here. And the one positive benefit might be if we could get the country to say, let's keep our indigenous species that has this high dollar value on the global market here so that it will be there for those people who come here to enjoy it. And up till now, all of the conch primarily has been going for export to unknown consumers. It's kind of like value added on mahogany wood. You don't send out boards of mahogany. As, as, as a, it's a very good analogy, but, but I think back to, to the reef analogy that's extremely important. When you, I didn't speak before, but when we talked about the primary carnivores over here as the troopers and the snappers and then the herbivores, what we need to do is remember that a reef is just a very easy, and it was the original uh, thing used on ecological environments and food pyramids. And something has to take, the sun grows the grass and the algae, but something's got to cut the grass so that the carnivores can eat it. The herbivores do that. And the biggest herbivore in this part of the world is the green pump. It eats all that algae and it turns it, whether it's a baby conch, whether it's a one year old, whether it's a roller, it turns it into something that even nurse sharks eat. It's hard to realize when you think of a nurse shark swimming along, you know, how to roll over a conch, suck on it, but it starts to roll up and go home having had a nice snack. National Geographic filmed that down at French Keys a number of years ago, so it's not a fictional story. But I think that one thing that might fit this country's model that's a little bit different from the whole area that you've been engaged in is reviving the idea of a marine biosphere reserve. Mm -hmm. It's small, it's indigenous, it happens to have about the same geographic pattern as the Galapagos. It just doesn't have the land-based animals as a unique attraction, but it certainly has a marine environment that viable almost anywhere else. So that was talked about in years past, and it has never happened. Um. Yeah, I think if yes, yes, it was. It was very aggressively talked about, it. and it was behind what produced the parks, and it's behind what produced. I mean, think about this country has 33 park reserves and sanctuaries. How many countries this small? In population can say that. And they're being managed as much as is available. And the one thing that will change the management level and structure is going from under aware to having young people say, this is what our future depends upon. Both from climate change, from a hurricane viewpoint. I mean, you have to hesitate and 
think the couple of hurricanes we've had in the last five years here, including the last one of the category five, if we didn't have that reason, you wouldn't have anything other than the skeletons of hotels on the North Shore region. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's beyond ability to appreciate the value of that region. There's some numbers, I don't have them offhand, but that, yeah, from Mexican scientists that calculated, I think it was after Wilma, which was a category five that hit, the King Street came on its way up. And they calculated it in terms of um, an atom bomb, and it was like the equivalent energy of an atom bomb is what the grief had absorbed and kept from their shore. So it was crazy. It was a crazy amount of energy that's dissipated on that reef. The reef takes it for you, so your shoreline mm -hmm. gets a lot less. There's, there's another quick question on the, on the food pyramid type thing. You've had a lot of pictures of, of the Caribbean lobster. Do you all monitor its abundance in what you do, or is it strictly fish? It, it is. We, don't, we haven't pulled it into the um, indicator. Um, but we do monitor it in the protocol. I'm not entirely convinced that the sample size that we do is adequate. But if you if you rolled it up onto that um, the level of the subregion, so you're aggregating all that data together, you could get some measure. I mean, if you're going to really go out and sample lobster, you kind of need that. We do the belt transects that we, we look for diadema sea urchins, lobster, and conch. And I think for Diadema is probably okay because it's a 10 meter long by one meter. You do 10 of them per site. But for something like lobster that's like moving around and more hidden, I don't know, kind of think you probably need a larger sample um, to get a really good number. So I don't know if it would, if it would equate to, and then there's the fisheries departments are doing lobster surveys, so we don't want to like, you know, put out a number that's different than their number, and their number is probably better, but we're going to might get more attention for our number, you know, that's, that's the problem using that data, because the data is really designed for uh, more benthic organisms, not lobster. The fish counters don't do lobster for whatever reason, for a long fish belts. So. You're supposed to, doing the fish service, you're supposed to note. Note that you see them. Yes. So you can get some kind of presence, yeah. absence, data. But, I mean, that is something we could look at on that large scale and see. I'm sure you would see differences. Okay, How many marine species are being monitored? How many marine species? Um, well, we monitor all of the coral. That would be like 60 something. You're not going to see all of them. You're probably going to see 25 or something. But you're looking for all of the species of coral. And then within macroalgae and stuff like that, it's more like a genus level than species for the most part, you know. But, I mean, everything benthic is too different. Well, you've done the agri training, right? Were you one of the people that did the agri training? So, you did fish. Oh, you did fish, okay. So, well, that, how many fish is in that? That's 60 something species of fish. So we're not looking at all fish species, right? It's, it's those agro families as an indicator. It's important. Biodiversity is, you know, extremely important. But that extra effort you would have to put to like really try to get a full measure of what's out there. I mean, they do it in a few places in the world, and then even then, sometimes I've been in meetings with the scientists who are like, okay, what does this mean? Smithsonian has these arms that they put out there. It's a big box-like thing with all these um, filters, and they basically just filters and things recruit to it over a year and then they take all of that and they wade through it and they try to identify all these tiny little creatures and then they put what's left in a blender, literally in a blender, and they do DNA on it and they've been able to extract like all kinds of organisms, even viruses, bacteria, and you know, plant tonic forms of marine life that are known that have been barcoded and then you get this number that and the end, they're in the meeting, and we're like, well, and then what? Because they're coming up with data that doesn't, like, you have a good area for biodiversity, what we think is a good read, and then it has a lower value for that total biodiversity stuff. And then some other area that's not as good has, like, a higher number. Like, what does this mean? And nobody knows yet. So maybe it will be figured out in the end, but total biodiversity would be 
extremely difficult and expensive and maybe not as useful to manage them. So we kind of focus on the things that are like um, known to be more important to management or what we need to deal with. Yeah. In your uh, research, you talk
different topic that you can see. You go on it, and we'll show your little um, version of, of how to kick those mics for on the one. So, uh, like I said, the good thing about this Weep Health Index is that you can, you know, summarize your entire region. So for us, we did the, the whole Desert American Reef, there's four countries. Overall, you can turn it into one number. It's 2.8. So we scored when you averaged out all those 300 sites, give them their five point scoring based on the four indicators. Of five being perfect, we scored a 2.8. So, you know, it tells you you're, you're somewhere a little over halfway there, but you're not like to be, you're considered fair, and the one thing that's um, not a fair condition, that's in poor condition, is that fleshy macroalgae right there, that orange bit. Okay, but we can also see that uh, over time, these things have improved. All of them, except the fleshy macroalgae, has actually gotten better over time. So the fleshy macroalgae has gone up 23% on the mar y overall from 12%. 2006. So that was our biggest problem. But the thing that you know we have very little control over as managers is that percent of coral cover. Because really, you know, people aren't directly going out to harvest corals. They're not intentionally harming the corals. But and we do have things like coral bleaching and coral disease outbreaks that induce coral cover. But we managed in that 10 years to actually increase it um, up to. Uh, like 18%. So here you can see when you break it down by the four countries, it's nice to talk about the region overall, but each country is in charge of their own breed and in charge of their own management. So really, you know, they want to see how is their country doing in relation to others. So you can see that there's quite a difference. You know, Belize and Mexico look very similar. Um, over time, Mexico has had a little more variability. Belize has kind of been Jumping along quietly, that purple line is the herbivorous fish. So you can see how that has actually increased. The red is the fleshy macroalgae, which we began to see a little decrease in this last <coughs> time. Hopefully, that is due to the parrotfish protection that was done in 2009 so back here. And that's we can see that little trajectory. The corals in Belize haven't been as good as in. Some of the other countries, you see like Guatemala has increased more. Mexico has been a steady increase in the coral, which is the blue line. <clears throat> um, the fleshy macroalgae, again, pretty much overall just a big increase. So you can look at it, you know, once you have your data, you've been doing this for years. Oh, and Guatemala, be, I mean, Honduras being the only country where we actually have something ranked as very good. And that's those herbivorous fish. They have this crazy amount of parrotfish, which they pretty much had the highest parrotfish before they were even protected. They're protected in the entire Bay Islands, which is all of their offshore reefs. They're not protected on the, along the coast because the government felt like people needed them to eat. But even along the coast where they are still being fished, there's still a lot of them, which is a really interesting scientific question we don't really have the answer for. So within those data that I just showed you, those line graphs, that was all of the data that we have. So about half of it is contributed by the partner organization, so we don't collect it. And sometimes the sites vary a little bit year to year, like one part might not get all their, all their sites monitored, and other ones would, people's funding comes and goes. So anyway, we have 104 sites that we monitor that we go back to those same exact sites. So in terms of looking at it over time, I feel like that's a little bit more, um, it's more rigorous scientifically. And when you look at that, you can see, so 2006 is the dark blue. So this is the average. It was 13.4% and it went up to 17.7 overall, so bar Y. Um, but country by country, you can see like Belize has kind of had a smaller increase than say Mexico had the largest. Um, Guatemala had an increase in coral cover and Honduras had some left. So, and you can begin to relate that to things that were going on. Mexico, for example, had had a hurricane right before we did these surveys in 2006. They had a major hurricane in 2005. So some of this is kind of expected. You know, hurricanes are natural. They knock down the coral, and then it begins to go back. So 
part of that is how it's playing with that. But the coral cover only tells you part of the equation because it really matters which coral is there. So coral cover is just did your point fall on coral and you need that to accrete a reef. But these big reef building corals, there have been a few scientific papers recently looking at the fact that there's fewer of those and more of the weedy corals. So we decided to look at our data set and see, well, is that true in the Mesoamerican reef? We know we've seen this increase in coral cover, but is it the good corals? Is it the coral species that actually build a reef, or is it the weedy ones that are moving in and just quickly taking up space? And we saw it was a little bit of a mixture of both. So um, Mexico and Honduras had the increases in their corals, like this nice star coral here, but Belize and Guatemala, the increase in coral cover was more due to the Belize species. That's not as, you know, not as good a story, but it is at least as coral and not something else, like fleshy macrobiome. So this is where we're looking at, but again, those 104 sites that were the exact same sites in the, in the two time periods. And we, but we can see that the difference is significant in every country, just the increase in fleshy macroalgae. So this is the main signal that we have from the whole data. You know, a lot of the data, because we're looking at so many different locations, signals are really small. Sometimes they're not significant. But in, in every country, that increase in flesh and agroalgae is significant. And it's worrisome. So we started looking at the leaves in particular. Like, can we see the impact? Yeah, that's when we got protected. Um, and then you begin to see, yes, can see that the river's fish, the purple line, has in, you see it increasing, and then you begin to see the fleshy macroalgae decreasing. But we felt like, you know, you're not seeing that in the other countries yet. There's a time lag. This is taking too long. And, you know, we promote this policy, but then we're barely seeing a good impact of it. So we started thinking, well, what about the other um, herbivores? You know, the fish is only a component of it. And actually, the fish are a little bit selective in the way that they feed. They choose which fleshy macroalgae they care to bite. And some fish, some species of parrotfish, bite fleshy macroalgae. Some don't. They really go for just turf algae. So it also depends on which species you have. But the, these diadema urchins, which you're not seeing, there they are. Diadema urchins are really good. So they are more of like a vacuum cleaner that uses scraping mechanism clean the bottom and they really get at everything. But you can see that most of our, our sites, 85 of these 104 sites, have um, <coughs> no diadema at all. So this species, just in case you don't know that story, it's, it's known as the um, one of the largest mass mortality events in the ocean ever. It's like this species is flat with a long spine sea urchin died out in like 1980, around 82. It started somewhere near Panama, curiously, near that canal where water comes in from the Pacific. Not saying anything, but curiously. And they moved uh, with the current patterns of um, urchins that were in Florida inside aquaria with flow through seawater started dying in their aquariums. So it was definitely water transmitted. And it killed them all, almost all. It killed them, like 98% of the population. And so it's been on like two years. Finally, they're starting to come back. So they're beginning to come back in these little patchy locations. So it's like the recruits are out there. Some studies, especially in Puerto Rico, they're finding there's a decent number of larvae in the water. They do settle, they recruit, but then they die somewhere along the way. So they're, they're dying. Um, most have no urchins. This is the level that we can see. Like, look, if you have at least um, that's like half an urchin per meter square, which is kind of weird to think about. One urchin per two meter square, you have at least that many. You can think of a meter square, at least you've got one urchin for every two meter square, then you're on average less than 10% fleshy macroalgae. So that's not bad. If you can get it down to the next one, down to having one per meter square, then you, none of the, all those sites, I mean, there are only six sites that had that many urchins, but their average was 5% fleshy macroalgae. So it's like, hey, these guys are really important, and what if we can do something from a management intervention to help bring back 
the diadema, then we will really see a benefit on the reef. They also tend to produce this crustose coralline, like their scraping action clears off the bottom and rips up the whole fast, the, like anchors the, the fleshy macroalgae, and then you can have the growth of that nice purple crustose coralline. That helps facilitate coral recruitment, so that's a good thing. So we are kind of looking at um, what we could do to help facilitate their recruitment back naturally or by transplanting them. In some areas that they have come back, they're almost overabundant because they can begin to mm -hmm. harm the reef and degrade the reef when they get too abundant. They, their scraping action actually reduces it. So we, we have seen a very slight increase over that 10 year period, 0.12, but you see on average how low mm -hmm. their density is, up to 0.16. So, but that is, that's an idea of how you can do that by facilitating, um, letting them grow to a certain size in laboratories and then receive <coughs> That's one idea that's out there. That can help recreate your structure. So one thing we talked about, like the two indicators is flesh and macroalgae and coral cover, but these other things are also really important, that crustose core line, the, the purple hard film that helps facilitate coral recruitment also being really important. So you can look at the benthic composition. So that's, benthic just means what's on the bottom, what's composing that bottom. It's not just coral and flesh and macroalgae, there's a lot of other things. And so we've kind of ranked those other things in terms of blue if they're good, and orange if they're bad, if they detract from coral growth. And you can see that Mexico, although their coral color seems pretty good, Live coral is the darkest one here. They've got less of the other good stuff and more of the bad stuff. So they've got all this toss, which I think from reading the report, that's called turf algal sediment map. So it's just the turf becomes, a, uh, sediment becomes embedded, and the turf is like a, a lawn, very fine filaments, just like grass. So it's not really too bad, fish come and eat it. Things can grow, grow on top of that normally, like coral can even recruit into that. Um, so it doesn't prevent <coughs> other things from happening on the reef. It's kind of like open space. Mm -hmm. But if you get the sediment folding into that, and then the map, and then it forms a map, the turf actually forms a map, then nothing can come in. And you're just left with this kind of brown, um, encrusted gum. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's um, got some pictures of it later, but it's a problem. And Big in Mexico, not so much in the rest. And I saw from the data, it looked like it was kind of a problem here. So because we've got this focus on the macroalgae as being the main thing that is a problem here for us in the best American reef, we started with the parrotfish. We said, well, easy enough. It's not a target fishery here. Let's get the government. So we worked with the fisheries department. We worked with fishermen and groups all the other NGOs to help. Everybody's pushing at this from different angles. Each country did it in a different way based on how the dynamic in that country worked. But as of last fall, we have it done in all four countries. So that's a big check mark. But we've already kind of moved into the next part of the game. It's like, well, maybe we need to do a little more interventions with our hands, possibly even human hands. This is a picture from Hawaii. So I don't, we're not really planning to do the vacuum, so we will just do manual removal. And I, I did this when I was in grad school with one pilot study where you can actually weed the reef just like you would weed your garden. So you pull up that fleshy macroalgae that gets stuck there and just won't go away. Not enough fish, not enough urchins, it's already grown up to a certain height. So you get rid of it, there's still some hold fast there, so it will grow back. But if you have enough herbivores, they can kind of keep it trim so it doesn't get as low as that. So that's a little pilot study that we have on today. Um, also working with a group in Honduras that wants to raise the diagram in these big runs, get them up to a decent size and then take them back all to the reef. So that's being tested in, in two little um, bays. And there's one location in Honduras where they've come back in this high quantities. It's a location along the coast right here so we're going to be taking them from there mm -hmm. to Roatan, the Bay Islands, where there's very few of them. Can I ask, because you said there's still been a stage that it never comes out of 
run with it. So, yeah. Well, that's like this this place. Oh, okay, so the last thing is the enhancing the king crab, and we'll do that. This place, um, these are the two locations where we're doing the crab, and that's the two locations of the urchin. So, this place here is Taylor Bay, and it has naturally gotten to the point that it's like borderline eroding. So, that's why we're taking them from there and just transplanting them over to here where there's bays with the melon. So um, there's only a handful of places that have gotten to that level. But if they did, you could just still redistribute them. So but you need that one training you know, to make sure that like you have yeah. that. Then. And then they've gotten to that level, you know, with no human intervention. It's probably just the current patterns right. that they end up, you know, retaining the larvae and they landed there and it was good structure. So that seems to be the, the reef topographic complexity, so how much structure there is for the small urchins to hide in seems to be the key ingredient. And so much of the reefs have been flattened by hurricanes and coral death and loss of those branching corals that you end up with these flattened reefs with no good shelter. So it, that's probably why they're, they're taking so long to come back. So in areas where you have good complexity, sometimes you're getting a lot. And so Managers can choose to take from those areas where there are almost too much, too many of them, and put them in the other areas where you've got to at least have enough structure. Sometimes these things are they try them and they fail because they just end up feeding fish because <coughs> the urchin has nowhere to hide, and you have fish predators there. There's certain fish, like especially trigger fish, that can just blow them over and roll them over, and then they eat their yummy insides. So. You know, you've got to put it in the right location, but you know, given the possibility that they can really help you get down that macroalgae that's your big problem, it seems worth. You know, we're doing it as a little pilot study, and we'll see what happens. And, and no, if, no one ever put together what actually killed off the spiny urchin. No, they weren't able to. It happened so fast. I mean, yeah, it did I, I know when it happened. I was here, and I, I said, "Where'd they go?" Yeah. All of a sudden, just see what and, and all and over all these years. They never Oh, it's waterborne. Yeah. <laughs> and that might fall. So, yeah, we're doing the manual removal as pilot studies in Mexico. There's a, a small bay, small bay overrun with a lot of flesh and macroalgae, and they have a, one of these tourist volunteer programs that one of the NGO partners will run. So, they train you know, a set of like students that come in for about eight weeks and they learn to do things. So that's one of the projects that they want to do. So we'll see if that works. You know, it doesn't actually cost conservation things. <coughs> those students pay for their, their experience. And we'll see if they can actually produce something good by, by reading the weed, reading, reading the reed, <laughs> and then seeing if the natural herbivores that are there to maintain. That's the idea. <coughs> but we know that. I mean, the herbivores are a part of the equation. So, you know, these macroalgae are growing, and you need someone to graze it down. You need some organism to be, provide that herbivory. But if the nutrients in the water are such that you're just still fueling the growth of these macroalgae, you may not be able to do enough. You may not be able to put enough herbivores in there to keep that down, because it's just, some reefs and in locations where, you know, in the past it wasn't a nutrient source. I think that's part of the issue because we have some reefs that are continental that are fairly near rivers. Um, and they seem to have kind of evolved in that context. The corals that are there and just the individuals, probably the genetics of those corals are more adapted to a higher nutrient environment. But when you have corals like you probably got out here, you can look at that water you have not pointing the right way, I don't know. <laughs> but the, the water, thank you. The water is like very clear, and your corals must be adapted to clear water. They don't want a lot of nutrients in the water. They're not continental reefs like those reefs you heard about. They're existing right off the Orinoco. Right? You know, I mean, there's probably two or three species of corals on those reefs because that's all that can be down. But the fact that they're there is kind of amazing. But in your situation where you've got a natural low nutrient um, waters where the coral reefs evolved and grew, they don't want more nutrients. 
So it will, it will mess up the balance. Then. So you look at the sources of nutrients, and you can see you've got hotels, you've got like uh, wastewater treatment or septic or deep well injection. That's like we had a little symbol for that. That's what in Mexico they do a lot of this deep well injection that just gets it out of your smell zone deep into that aquifer and then it bubbles out of the reef. Right. And it's um, still getting there. So and that's kind of like raw. raw. They, they do a little bit of primary you know, removal of solids and things. But <coughs> I came here from Nantucket and we actually had a serious algae problem up in our harbor. And the health inspector started going around in a boat and testing the water around boats that were moored there. And there were serious consequences if there was a serious uh, um, bacteria or fecal bacteria around that boat. Um, there were serious consequences. Also, they limited people or prohibited people from um, fertilizing their lawns and their gardens and so forth, particularly if they lived along the, um, the, har the upper harbor area. So, and they did test for it. So. It really made a difference in time. It, uh, it improved. I've heard a lot of stories of, um, in Australia, one of the groups that we kind of modeled the healthy reefs on was a group called Healthy Waterways in Australia. And they monitored things like rivers that were going out to their you know, continental reefs too. Um, but they did a study of um, E. coli and another enterococcus, you know, human, it's a bacteria in the human gut. It, it's an indicator of sewage presence. And they did that all along the coast and made these maps with red zones. And so the mayors of the towns that got the red zones were like, oh my gosh, we don't, we don't want you to produce any more of these maps, or what can I do to you know, not be in this awful red zone for sewage contamination? And so they used that to help spur them, well, you do need to pass that ordinance that's going to like get you the new sewage treatment plan. It's going to cost $2 million or whatever, but yeah, you got to do that because it has to be treated. Well, I've heard from people who were involved with wastewater management here that the, um, the hotels and the resorts are not being properly managed. The wastewater treatment plants are not being properly um, dealt with. Each, so each resort is in charge of their own um, yeah. units, their little plants. Yeah, somebody's supposed to be going around <coughs> and checking them whether or not they really are. I don't know, but it's going out there. They, they are because of at Ocean Club West, where I live, uh, we had to do some major upgrades to our sewage treatment after environmental health was there. Good, uh, good. So, but that's one thing that is, is another project that we're trying to get off the ground, and that is to do regular water quality testing up and down Grays Bay with yes. all, the, all the hotels and stuff. And all the fertilizers. Yeah, yeah. So fertilizers the on the landscaping and chemicals on the landscaping. Yeah. Um, we're trying to get that set up now mm -hmm. so we can do that on a regular basis. Will that be done through government or done through individuals? Through us, through the refund. Okay. So then you make a red zone map. Exactly. You yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but what comes out of this is we, we had a report last year uh, from one of the local veterinarians who was, was snorkeling at um, Coral Gardens and came back and reported that the fish were not looking healthy there. So we went out and did a quick check of the water quality, and the good news is there wasn't an issue. The other good news is I don't know what she was, what this vet was looking at because I went out and snorkeled it, and the fish looked fine. Mm -hmm. So, but it gave us a bit of a scare, and we thought yeah. we better do it. So we 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 we're trying getting that set up now, uh, so we can start doing that on a regular. I just see people people standing on the reef. Yep. There quite a bit. Even though it was a, a cordoned off area, they still go inside. Well, the uh, TCI Middle School group here is uh, got a project going where we're going to improve the signage there. Actually, we're going to put a, a big banner just inside that ring of boys telling people to stay out of there. Mm -hmm. Because the only signage that we've had has been on the beach, and that got blown away in the hurricane and hasn't been replaced yet. Um, so, working with them to get that that project done. So, right, sorry. So yeah, you, um, the sources, you know, any location, you could be looking for the sources of where the nutrients are coming from. 
but often yet yeah, there are other things like fertilizers, well that's the tree, but um, the agrochemicals that would also be sprayed on, mm -hmm. like landscaping, mm -hmm. and that can have serious um, serious repercussions for larval, particularly larval phases of fish. And yeah, yeah. You know, sunscreens have gotten a lot of attention now, but those you know, mm -hmm. pesticides are like targeted to disrupt physiological systems. Well, they had to stop too, or look, because they were killing all the shellfish off. Yeah. yeah. In the, in the uh, marina. Yeah. Harbor area. So, these are, you know, in addition to like looking at uh, the main herbivores and trying to bring back and figure out how you can help increase the populations of herbivores, you've also got to work on the bottom up part. And so, sewage treatment. Uh, you might, I don't know if Turks and Caicos has signed that Cartagena Convention, but that's something that once you sign it and ratify it, then United Nations, is, UNEP is supposed to help provide some funding to help countries implement it. So I think that's a good thing to put on your, your list. Do you, do you guys know from, from the Environment Department? It's been signed. It's like, I'm not sure. A lot of that is done by the UK government and not directly by ourselves. Uh -huh. I don't know if the UK has signed it, actually. I know the US has not signed it. Okay. No. Uh, but most of the other Caribbean countries have signed it. Now most of uh, Latin America, South America have signed it. Okay. And then thinking about um, what other natural ecosystems are important to help filter nutrients. I mean, nutrients are you know, natural, and they're coming off the land. And, and many natural processes through estuaries and wetlands, you get nutrients. But the whole system of filtration and absorption of these nutrients, having healthy seagrass beds is a big component of that, and, and maintaining your mangrove fringes. So having mangroves in the area that absorb both nutrients and track sediments, and the same with seagrass. So we try not to Forget those ecosystems that are critically important, and also you know to maintain the full life cycle and have um, many of your commercial species are you know, require mangroves for their settlement or larval stages. So keeping all that intact. Um, there's some pilot studies or research type studies going on in Florida where they're looking at actually. Um, the way they fragment corals and plant them out, they're doing that with sponges in order to have them be filters. So they are like living filters. So that, that's a way of helping you clean your water before it gets to breathe, is doing these little outplant areas that would have some sponges. And so it's kind of, you know, I think we're getting to it a, 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 with bivalves too, in the estuary situations and bays where they're putting out oysters, they're hanging oysters on. Mm -hmm lines and things and like getting bivalves to grow because they do actually clean the water. So thinking about those certain forms of mariculture that are actually beneficial to the water because they're cleaning. 